be so surprised when you see what the message is about. It's unbelievable. All right. Y'all find 1 Corinthians chapter 9. What a beautiful, beautiful day. And I'm just so, so grateful to just be here and to be with you. And uh, the way things have just kind of developed today, you're going to be so surprised when you just see where we are and what, what God's got for us today that the Lord just puts all these things together. Amen? He, he really does. And so uh, let's read our text. We're going to read about 12 uh, verses of this. We're, we've been talking about our witness and really the entire book, 1 Corinthians, in my opinion. As we go through, you'll see Paul's been talking about our witness no matter what it was. He says to the Corinthians at first, the first four chapters, he talks about divisions. He says, don't be divisive. Your witness is, is terrible in the community and in the culture. Don't, don't do that. And then he goes through and Paul talks about immorality and holiness and watch your witness, watch your witness, watch your witness. And everything he does has led us up to this point right here. And then we're coming to the sections pretty soon where Paul talks about, uh, he, he says, your worship services ought to be the way they should be in order to mind your business, mind your witness. So this whole thing, the entire book is about our witness. And so Paul uh, comes here now. We've been talking about uh, how to put that life out there. So now in, ver- in chapter 9, in this verse, these, these verses, he says, uh, Paul says, here's an example, and he uses himself. And so I'm going to read these and then go into one or two verses of the next section ahead of time so that you can see if you just read this, you'd say, well, Paul is being kind of cocky. He's being, he's being the person who's claiming all these rights and says, hey, I can do this. I have freedom in Christ. But then when he gets to verse 12b and verse 15, he says, but I gave up those rights, and I don't require those rights. And the reason that I gave that up was because of the gospel, because, because of the kingdom, and because of you. And so uh, one has said this, we don't have the right to give up our freedom, but we do have the right to give up our rights. You cannot give up your freedom in Christ. Listen to this passage. You may have never heard this passage, Galatians 5.1. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Your freedom in Christ is a witness, is an example of who you are in Christ. You, you can't give up your freedom. You have freedom in Christ. Each and every one of us has uh, the liberty to do what we want. We have liberty in Christ. And so, but he says, you can't, you, you do give up your rights, your freedom, uh, you can't, but your rights you can. And so I give up my rights, Paul says, in order to protect my freedom so that you see me giving up my rights, what I want to do in order to please Christ. And so let's read this in the first nine verses. This is right after chapter 8 where Paul has talked about, we did last week, about meat offered to idols. And so we looked at all the ramifications of that. And so Paul says, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If I'm not an apostle to others, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. My defense to those who examine me is this. Don't we have the right to eat and to drink? Don't we have the right to be accompanied by a Christian wife like the other apostles, the Lord's brothers, and Cephas or Peter? Or do Barnabas and I alone have no right to refrain from working? Whoever goes to war at his own expense, no one, Paul says, but who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit? Or who shepherds the flock and does not drink the milk from the flock? Am I saying this from a human perspective? Doesn't the law also say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, don't muzzle the ox while he's treading out the corn or the grain. Is God really concerned with oxen or isn't he really saying it for us. Yes, this is written for us because he who plows ought to plow in the hope and he who threshes should do so in hope of sharing in the crop. And if we have sown spiritual things for you, is it too much if we reap material benefits from you? If others have this right to receive benefits from you, don't we even have more? However, 
we have not made use of this right. Instead, we endure everything so that we will not hinder the gospel of Christ. Now look closely at verse 15. But I have used none of these rights, and I've not written this to make you to make it happen that way for me. In other words, Paul said, I'm not mentioning this thing about being uh, given things for you, for your support, so that you will do that. He, Paul said that to the Philippians too. He said he thanked them for all that they had done for him. And then he says, I'm not saying that so you'll give me another gift. I'm praising you and thanking you for that. So, and Paul says this, for it would be better for me to die than for anyone to deprive me of my boast. Paul says, I, I would rather die than have someone think they gave me something and that I demanded it from them. And so Paul says, here's what the law says. I'm your apostle. I'm your pastor, so to speak, until I move on. And I'm going to leave you a pastor. But your pastor has a right to make a living from the ministry. Paul says, I can require that of you. But Paul says, I'm not even going to do that. Paul was a tent maker, you know. And so here we, we want to honor God. Paul says, I'm going to honor God with my witness. Paul says, by the law, and if you'll get this little formula in your head, it'll tell you how to live a Christian life. You ready? So we don't want to live legalistically. The word legalistic actually refers to law and obedience. I don't want to do everything because God told me to. Y'all all right? Why do you do that? Well, you tell your children, please don't do that. And you want your children to love you and respect you. You don't want them to say, well, this is a law at my house, and I'm just going to... We, we have to do everything in a legalistic manner. And I'm going to obey God because the law said this. I don't want a Jew to do more through the law than I do through love. Y'all all right? So legalistic Christians are the most aggravating people on the planet. I mean, they are some kind of a mess, let me tell you. They're fussy about everything. Everything, all the, the I's have to be dotted, all the T's crossed. And they set their own standards of righteousness. And I love you too if you're legalistic but you can be some kind of aggravating, I want to tell you. Then on the other side of that, we have license. A license is a permit. You, you go and you say, well, I've got to get a license. The license gives you permission to drive an automobile. You get a license to, uh, for deer hunting. It allows you to kill so many deer a year. You get permission to do those things. And Paul says, you don't want to live in license either and say, let's just disregard the rules altogether. And so what I want to teach you is what Galatians 5.1 said. Paul says, I want you to live in liberty. I know the laws of God. I want to keep the laws out of love. And as I grow in Christ, my freedom allows me to do different things. And Paul says, I understand all of the law, and I could demand these things from you, but what I want to do is live in the law of liberty. And Paul says, I'm not going to demand anything from the churches. He says, what I'm going to do is live my life and trust God for what he's going to do for me. And that's living in the law of liberty. And so you know the law. There are some things that you just point blank. The law says no adultery, no murder, no lying, no stealing. You don't have a right to do that. That doesn't play into your liberty. But if you're going to be a person that plays cards or goes to the movies or wears shorts or whether you wear makeup or not, in many denominations, the ladies don't wear pants. And if that's what you want to do, have at it. Doesn't make any difference to me. Ain't any of, my, any of my business whether you wear makeup or not. I don't care. You have liberty in Jesus Christ. If you want to live on the legalistic side, you're just hurting yourself. I'm not bringing cows and bulls and doves to church. I'm not living by the law. I'm going to live in the liberty of Jesus Christ. He's the once for all sacrifice forever given, and I'm going to be there, okay? I'm not going to pester you about what you eat, what you drink, and where you go. You have the Holy Spirit living in you. It's called liberty. And so here Paul comes, I want to show you a very unique word as we get started. In verse number 1, our outline goes like this. This is Paul's argument. The next thing, the next section of Scripture next week, Paul's going to say, here's the example. I'm going to give you an argument, I'm going to give you an example, and then Paul says, I'm going to give you an invitation. So here's what Paul says. I'm going to, I'm going to argue my case right here. I'm going to show you how I'm living it. I'm going to give you the example. And then I'm going to invite you to come join me. If you don't come join me, it's your liberty. You can do whatever you want to. And so here we're going to go. So Paul, Paul literally, he, he comes and says, here's my argument. Now I want to show you something real neat. Let's go to verse 3 before we look at verse number 1. And Paul says in verse number 3, um, very uniquely, uh, 
if a man, he says, I'm an apostle, but he says, my defense, the, the reason I'm doing these things, he said, my defense of my apostleship in the Lord. He talks about his defense to the people who are going to examine him and what he's teaching. And so actually what Paul is doing is setting the stage. Paul uses literally a legal term, the word for defense right there. Some of you may literally have the word apology in your text. It's the Greek word apologia. It's a very unique word. We get our word apologetics from that. It's the branch of Christian theology which has as its aim the, the reasoned advocacy of the Christian faith. It means to defend the Christian faith. It includes positive arguments. This is what our faith actually is. This is what the Scripture says about who we are as Christians. It also is a rebuttal to the criticisms of people who disagree with the things that we teach. Now, we have changed the term. Uh, it, when we speak of an apology in English, it's different from the Bible word for apology. And so if I were to offend someone, if I offended Brother Brother Sanford, I would go to him and I say, Brother Sanford, I'm so sorry about what I said and what I did. Would you please forgive me? I don't make any charges. I don't make any excuses. I don't do anything. That's the English word for apology. It's apologia here, but the word apologia here is quite different. Uh, I'm not going to apologize for the truth. I'm going to give a defense for the truth. Amen? So usually when we go and we say, hey, would you please forgive me, we add something to it. What is it? Uh, Brother Sanford, I'm sorry I was late. My dog got out and I couldn't catch him. My cat was on the roof and I just couldn't get there. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And so we add some, some, <laughs> some leverage to it. You know what I'm saying? I want to make an excuse. That's not the biblical word for apology. Paul says, I'm, I'm southern. I'm, about, I'm fixing to put some truth on you. And this is the apology for where we are. And Paul says, I want you to know the difference. This is my defense to the people that attack who we are. Now, Paul's still setting the stage because he's going to ring some bells before we get out of here. Y'all all right? And so here is going to be, when we get to chapter 12, 13, and 14, and I start talking about spiritual gifts, some of you have been taught some of the craziest things in your whole life. And when I teach you the truth, I'm going to give you the apology. And many people over the years, when I teach that, they'll come to me after and say, yeah, but what about this, Brother Jerry? And I'll say, I'm just telling you the truth. And if you don't receive the truth, that's up to you. But here's my defense. And so Paul says, I'm going to teach you what the defense actually is. Paul says, I am free. All Christians are free. He says, I am unrestrained. He says, aren't I not free? And so some people come to me and they say, well, well, you've done this, 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 and this. Or they come to you and say, hey, you shouldn't have done this, that, and the other. And you say, aren't I free in Christ? Who are you? Are you the resident Holy Spirit in everybody's life? Have y'all ever been around somebody who was the resident Holy Spirit for somebody else? Uh, we had some folks that left the church one time because they told me uh, our youth that in that day, they were just the ungodliest kids. They didn't want their kids around them. Their kids were some of the worst kids I've ever known in my life. Their kids were so sheltered and locked in the closet. And I said, at some point, you've got to turn them loose. You've got to let them out in the world. So Paul says, I'm free. I'm not liable to you. Paul says, I'm an apostle. I saw the Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus. In other words, Paul says, I've seen Christ. I have experienced and seen the resurrection. So the only way a man can call himself an apostle is if he has a message, if he's been sent with the message, and he has seen the Lord Jesus. He's seen the resurrection. Paul saw the Lord Jesus. And so, uh, and, and then Paul says this beautiful thing. He says, uh, if I am not an apostle to others, at least... I am to you, you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. And I want to tell you, that word seal, the Lord has done such a work in my heart that this is just absolutely amazing. I've, I've been just thinking all weekend and wanting all, everything that's in me, wanting to get to this so that I could share this beautiful message with you. Now, I've always understood what this word meant. I've always understood what the shepherd and the sheep relationship was about. 
I have wanted to start Woodlake many years ago and bring about this shepherd sheep relationship. There's no CEOs here. There's no executives here. We're all God's people trying to do what we're doing. The people that I've brought on staff are people that love the sheep, want to minister to the sheep, work with the sheep, and this is what I've tried to present. But this word now, after doing it for all these years, the Lord has just opened my heart and let me see the truth of this passage and the richness of it. And I want to tell you, it's just really just, uh, just opened my heart up with all of these deep and wonderful emotions. Paul is laying the ground for it, for a foundation for his argument, his, his apology, his defense, that he is teaching them and he's saying, what I'm telling you is correct. He's asking them, how many of you are apostles? How many of you have seen Jesus? How many of you have the proof of your ministry? You ever seen all these wannabe preachers that want to go around and start churches and get on staff somewhere? And they're just wannabe preachers. And you'll ask them, where's the proof of your ministry? What have you done? Why are you doing this? What Dr. Rogers used to say, and I'm going to get to this next week, but it fits perfectly right here. When a man gets out of seminary and he's, gra- he's a graduate, what do you think the first thing he wants to do is? He wants to get a job. And he said, I need a spot. That's the word. And we got to school. I, I got to find a spot, man. I got to find a spot. And Dr. Rogers just wore us out in chapel one day. We were all about to graduate, and Dr. Rogers said, if you'll just look to Jesus to fulfill your calling and stop looking for a job. Did the Lord call you to preach? If he called you to preach, get on the street corner and preach. That's what you're called to do. And if you get on the street corner and preach, God will get you a spot. (laughs) Look, Paul says, you are the seal of my ministry. I always love it when people come to Woodlake. They say, man, you know, over the years, they say, you know what you all need here at Woodlake? I said, boy, you just walked in the door. How do you know what we need right here? And then I want to say, have you seen Jesus? Are you an apostle? Are you you a pastor? Show me the proof of your ministry. Are you just a wannabe preacher? Are you looking for some a position or some authority? Uh, Do you just want a, a place you can call home and say, oh, this is... Brother Jerry's church or Brother Bob's church or your interest in your sheep and the kingdom of God. How many of you have the proof of your ministry? Don't I have freedom? Don't I have liberty? He says, I want to help you. The proof of a man's ministry is right before your eyes. Some of you are listening to people that are out of God's will. If you're not Sharing Jesus Christ, you're out of God's will. And if you're out of God's perfect will, you're in trouble. I asked a man, he said, I'm looking for a spot. I said, how many folks are you leading to Christ? Where are you preaching? He's out of God's will. He's not doing what God called him to do. Who says that I have to have a pulpit and a church to preach? Now, God's given me the blessing to have you. Now, I want to show you something right here. In verse number 2, Paul says, you are the seal of my ministry. Can I say to you that if I don't have you, I'm going to the street corner. But you, you are the proof of my ministry. Come on now. Come on. Hey, are we connected? Is the shepherd and the sheep connected? All these young preachers coming along, and they got that, man, they big. Baptist preachers are the biggest when they first hatched out. (laughs) And they think they're such great preachers that when they get in the pulpit and preach, people are going to go, oh, my goodness. What a man of God. Pastor, what do you want us to do? Now, that's not what God called you to do. The pastor called you to love those sheep. Because if they don't know that you love them, they will never listen to you. And so you have to build a relationship with them. And you have to love them. And I'll tell you what, you may not believe it, but I've done more in ministry going to the pulpit than I have in the pulpit. You look at somebody and they have tears in their eyes and you say, what's going on? I got a bad doctor's report today, Brother Jerry. And you sit down right there and pray with them and love on them, 
they won't ever forget that. But they will not remember what you preached that day. Won't happen. Let me explain this little word seal to you. This is the word phragis. It's the word for signet. Do you all remember that? This is a word for a, a seal or a fencing to protect against misappropriation. It is a mark of genuineness, of ownership. It's a mark of privacy. This is an extremely important word. The king used to say to one of his servants, I have an edict, and I want you to send it to so-and-so. And he would fold it up. They would drop the wax on it. He'd take his seal, his signet, and he would press down on it. And if it got to where it was going and the seal was broken, somebody was in trouble. A seal puts two things together. It's a protection. It is a proof of the privacy of it. It's the proof from where it came. It is an ownership. Now, don't misunderstand me. You are not, I do not own you, but make no mistake. When I read these passages where this word is used in other passages, and see, I've always known what this word means because I know John 6, 27. I know, first, I know 2 Corinthians 1, 21. You know this word very well, too. But as the Lord has revealed it to me, that you are the seal of my ministry, it puts us so close together that you can't separate us. And all over the Southern Baptist Convention, Church of God, Pentecostal, Holiness, Catholic, there are people that are at odds with their pastor. And that's not biblical. Listen, John 6, 27, On him God the Father hath placed the seal of approval. On who? Jesus. The, the word seal right there is so important that it, John is saying God is connected to Jesus so closely so intimately, infinitesimally, he's the God-man, he is God, he's eternal, that God's seal of approval was on the Son of God. You are the seal of my, of my ministry. That's a pretty good connection. Listen, 2 Corinthians 1, 21, Now it is God who has made both of us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, he set a seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. How close are you to the spirit of the living God that lives in you? That's close, baby. That's really close. God has proven to me that I belong to him because there's a seal upon my heart. As soon as I gave Jesus my heart, the Holy Spirit came into my life. How many times have you heard pastors say this? No Holy Spirit, no salvation. You see, if you sin, the Holy Spirit convicts your heart. That's how close you are to God because there's a seal, a Holy Spirit living within you. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. That's, mm. Revelation 6, 1. Boy, this is good right here. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. And when the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. And then another horse came out, which was the fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay one another. And when the, when the, when the Lamb opened the third seal, that's the opening of the seals of the tribulation. Do you think that word seal is important now? Do you understand that, that when Jesus Christ was there at the end of time, we know John tells us this is going to happen, John was weeping. He says there was no one there in all of, of the universe that could open that seal when God gave Jesus the deed to the universe. And the angel said, don't cry. There's a lamb. <laughs> He looks as if he's been slain from the foundations of the earth, a lamb from the tribe of Judah. He has right and authority to take the seal and open it up. That's close. Do you understand what happened in my heart when I realized from understanding this word that fully that you are the seal of my ministry? I don't know that I've loved you that much. 
I've tried. But how serious is that? How important? You know why? Because you and I are an example, a witness. How can Paul says, I'm living an honorable life. You Corinthians, you're the proof of my ministry. If I don't have you, I'm just a wannabe preacher. If you're leading and no one's following, you're just taking a walk. But when I began to preach the gospel and put things together, and the Lord Jesus Christ answers from heaven, and we have people that get saved, and then people join, and then you come, you're not investing in me, but you're investing in the kingdom of God. And you say, I'm joining Woodlake Baptist Church, and we're, we're going to move heaven and earth for the cause of Jesus Christ. That makes you the proof of my ministry. Can I say that I love you more right at this very moment than I ever have? Because I understand it more, and I thank God for teaching me this and showing it to me, and I couldn't wait to share it with you this morning. I'm amazed at the folks who are just so carefree. Uh, the people that I've fed and ministered to and cared for and loved on them, and then out of nowhere, they just got mad and left the church. Do you know what you just did? You just broke my heart. If you come to me, though, and say, Brother Jerry, we feel like God's moving us on, I want to thank not only you, but the people of Woodlake that we're having to move now. And I want to thank you for preaching the word to us, for my Sunday school class, for the fellowships that we've had, because we've been the seal of your ministry, and now God's moving us on. You know that's okay with me? I, I, I would be okay with that, but they don't do that. There are people that get mad and just run. The fruit of a man's ministry is the seal of his calling, and his pastoral ministry is his body. You are the body. You are the proof and the seal of my calling. Do you think we're connected? I'm going to tell you, we're connected. The shepherd and the sheep, it, it, it's not a slogan it's the truth. It's biblical. It's our existence. Sheep have to have a shepherd. And if a shepherd does not have sheep, he's not a shepherd. Let me give you a great example of this right here. About a month ago, Miss Olive broke my heart. She came to me and she said, Brother Jerry, I'm having to leave. And I'm going to be with my daughter and I have to sell my house, my stuff. And I want to thank you for being my pastor. And I want to thank you for the people of Woodlake Baptist Church. And I love you, and I love this church, and it's killing me to go, but I have to go. Now, that's how a person who is the seal of my ministry is supposed to leave. That's different from... They moved my Sunday school class, and Lord have mercy. God only moves in that one classroom, so we couldn't do it down there. And I'm mad, got my drawers in a knot, and I'm leaving. I did say that from the pulpit. You can mark it down. Joanne's over there going, all right, that's, that's enough. That did. Who does that to their pastor? I've invested in your life. You're the seal. Of, we're connected. That's how you leave, see? And some people say, well, bro, Jerry ain't my pastor. Then you need to go find a pastor. You all right? I mean, this is just so rich. Paul said, this is my, this is literally the proof of my ministry. Paul says, this is my defense. It, if I say, you know, hey, I, usually when people say that, they, I love it when people say, well, I mean, literally somebody got mad because the staff made so much money and we were given this much money. I don't know what budget he was looking at, but... You know, it's like, what are you talking about? Every church that does a new church start, they're heavy on money on the staff because you got to have staff. You just have to have them. And so and we all give this to missions and that. You know what they did? They went and joined the church where the pastor, six months after that, got fired because he was putting them in debt $10,000 a year. You see, they made a terrible mistake. And then you know where they are now? I know where they are. I just keep up with them. I love them. They were my sheep. And they need to be right here, here in the Word of God. They're in a liberal Baptist church not too far from here. That's where they are, you see. I've had people tell me, well, I'm just not getting the attention that I need. And then they go join First Snellville. You all right? I don't care if you go to First Snellville. That's your business. I don't care. It's a great church, a good church on Main Street now. 
You think you're going to get more attention at a church that's got 5,000 members or 150, 200, or 300? It makes no sense. You see, that's people, that's really, that's people that don't understand the shepherd and the sheep relationship. It's people who aren't investing in the kingdom. And Paul says to him in verse 3, this is my apology. And Paul states that the church had the responsibility to take care of him. Look at verse 4 through 6. Paul says, don't we have a right to eat and drink? Don't we have a right to accompany by a Christian wife? Paul says, don't I have the right to do what the other apostles are doing? Paul says, I got a right to do that. Paul says, wait a minute. I'm bivocational. I'm serving you for nothing. And then I'm working to make tents to make a living. He says, man, a lot of philosophers and teachers came through Corinth and guess what they did? They charged a fee for their philosophy sec- sections and, and uh, classes and things of that nature. Paul says, I didn't do anything. You know what Paul did? Paul went to the synagogue. Paul would go to the graveyard and lead somebody to Jesus if he had to. Went down by the river and started the church. And, you know, I mean, this was what Paul was. Paul chose to be bivocational and support himself. He, Paul says this, I would prefer to be given something out of love and respect every time over a demanded gift. I will never stand in this pulpit and demand anything from you. Not going to ever do that. If I get something from you, it comes from love and grace and mercy. Paul says, are, are me and Barnabas, are, are we the only ones that have to work for a living? Paul says, I will not be deprived of what happens to me. Notice verse 7. Paul says, he gives an example of a soldier. He says, does a soldier go to war and have to buy his own equipment? Well, if you serving under Barack Obama, you do. You have to buy your own helmets and stuff like that. Do you all remember that? You remember how foolish that was? We had men that went to battle who didn't have armor, body armor. Why? Because the, they just wouldn't give it to them. And people in the United States were paying for it. The churches were paying for it and sending it to our soldiers. How ridiculous. The, the vineyard farmer, if you cultivate a vine and you, you're entitled to the fruit. L- listen, we just came over my house one day back in the spring. I was plowing up stuff for my corn. And Charlie came, and Charlie helped me plow. Isn't that great? You know what that joker said when he left? I helped you plow, now I want some corn. <laughs> That's what that joker said to me. Doug came before that and busted it up with the tractor for us. Guess who's the two people that got corn out of Brother Jerry's garden? Doug and Charlie. Why? Why? Because a workman's worthy of his hire. Guess what I do when I'm out in picking in my garden? I got these little lemon drop tomatoes is what I call them. Oh, they're so good. And while I'm out there working, it's my garden. Guess what I do? I eat them. And when you come by to see me and I'm out there working, I say, taste one of those. People look at me like that and I say, pull it off the vine. It's okay. You see, he uses a shepherd. Does a farmer or the shepherd... Does he have the right to drink the milk? Yes, he does. I eat my tomatoes out there. I do everything. Everything I plant is mine. I can eat it if I want to. And so Paul gives that as an example. He says, hey, you guys, you're the seal and the approval of my ministry. You should take care, you should, you should take care of me, but I'm not asking you to. And he meant that. In verse number 8, he says, this refers to spiritual matters as well. Paul says, here's the law. Paul lets them know and understand what the law. Am I saying this from a human perspective? Doesn't the law also say the same thing? Paul says, if you want the law, if you want to be legalistic, let me give you a law. Don't don't muzzle the ox that's treading out the corn. If you've been blessed spiritually, if you've been blessed uh, emotionally or physically from your pastor, he said, good, then take care of the ox. Can you imagine an ox going around, grinding, moving that big stone and then if he stops to eat some of the grain that falls off, they whip him. That wouldn't make sense, would it? Don't muzzle the ox. Don't put a muzzle on the ox so he can't eat the grain. If you're plowing the field, you get to eat some of the grain. God even takes care of that. He tells the, the reapers, don't even reap the corners of the field. Let the poor get in there. Let them have some of it. You have plenty. Minister to others. In Deuteronomy 25, 4, it says the ox has a right to eat. In, in verse 10, he mentions the plowman and the thresher. Can you imagine the plowman, one who plants, the one who hoes the fields, one who eats the bounty, that he, he threshes the grain? He gets some of it. Now, everybody that participated in the barbecue this weekend, you guys did something when you pulled the meat off, didn't you? You brought it in the house, and what happened? And 
Charlie brought ours in and put it on the thing and and those kind of crunchy pieces on the top were just sitting there looking at me. I was waiting on one thing. You want to taste that? And then Wanda said, well, you cooked it, eat it. And we and me and Charlie dug in. So before y'all ever got it, we got ours, right? And so Paul says he uses that example. So the goal is to share in the crop. What is the crop? You. You are a pastor's crop. And I love you. Physical, spiritual sustenance. Let me tell you this. You may think this is funny, but I'm serious as I can be about this. So, last year, Brother David brought me some, some squash. And he brought me, early on, he brought me some squash and some uh, cucumbers. And here's what he said. Brother Jerry, this is the first fruits. We haven't had any of it. I want you to have my first fruits. He took a principle from the scripture. And he said, Pastor, I love you. Here's what he was saying. Pastor, I love you. And I want to give you the first fruits from my garden. Okay. You know what happens when y'all do that to me? It sets me on fire. And I am so grateful. And people look at everything in such a materialistic way. I, I, I mean, I, I, just, I just can't imagine. You know what I did? I said, Lord, I want you to bless Brother David, Don, and the kids. And I want, the kids didn't like it because I think the Lord blessed their beans. And they had to pick those beans. <laughs> and the last two years, they've had bumper crops of everything at their house. It is crazy. And you know what I think it was? I think it's because he showed kindness to his pastor. It didn't have anything to do with me. It was God honoring his faith. And just that it was just one of those things. Listen, the one who receives you receives me. And he, listen to this. And he who receives me receives the one who sent me. And anyone who receives a prophet because he's a prophet, he'll get a prophet's reward. And anyone who receives a righteous man uh, because he's a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. And if anyone gives, listen, you've heard this passage all your life, but I'm going to put it in context for you. Anyone who gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he's my disciple, I tell you, he will certainly not lose his reward. It's not what you keep, it's what you give away. And if you'll bless a, a godly man, listen, if you come to Brother Jerry's house and work, and the people that have worked for me will tell you this, if you charge me $300 for a job, I will give you $400. Do, do you know why? Because you're the seal of my ministry. You're my family. You're my, and I don't want you ever to, I don't want one of my sheep to ever leave my house and think my pastor didn't do me right y- y'all with me I'm going to go above and beyond the call of duty so you, you will never feel that way because I'm aware of this that if I bless a righteous man I get a righteous man's reward you see we've got to start thinking like this and so uh, l- listen people do things for Wood Lake Baptist Church all the time never ask for anything back listen when you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eat and drink whatever they give you. For the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. I mean, I really, really do take it very seriously. Some of you work at Woodlake for free. You do so much. It saves us money and helps us invest in the kingdom. During Christmas time, pastor appreciation, I really do appreciate all those gifts and things. I appreciate it when people cut the grass and paint and put up lights and all those things. Do you know it's going into your account because it goes into the kingdom of God. And Paul says, I could ask you to do that, but I'm not going to. I'm going to do it myself until someone does it. And when you invest into the kingdom, it is beautiful. So I really do take it very seriously. It doesn't matter if you drop me off some Tic Tacs in my office. 
And people give me certain things for over the years, and they don't even put their name on it. I know who gave it to me when it's sitting on my desk. And whether it's candy bars or a note of encouragement, I stop and I ask God to make all grace abound towards you. I, pre- I really I appreciate it. And so I just want to do what the Lord has done. I, I was standing in the hallway one time, and this is just show you how, this, just how some people just don't get this relationship. And we were about to have a meeting and go in, and we were doing budgeting. And I heard someone, I knew who it was, knew the voice. I even looked out to make sure. They said, if, if finance goes in and they give this church staff a 3% raise, I'm leaving this church. Now, who says that? I'm like, 3%? I mean, really? Like, did, did that sound like something? And I thought, and it hurt me to my heart. And then I remembered, then I said, but we were struggling financially at the time because of the person in the White House and the economy. And I wasn't going to give us a raise. I had already withdrawn and said to finance, we, don't, we, we can't afford to give anybody a raise. But after that, I went in there, and we got a 3% raise. Well, thank you. Bless your heart. And it wasn't long after that that they did leave. And all the time that I invested in them, it hurt me. I'm like, my goodness. And so I, I, I just, it was, it was quite strange. So let, let's do something real quickly, real quickly. So what does it take to run a church? Somebody says, well, all the preacher ever does is talk about money. I said, man, you just missed the whole joy of us giving to each other. Amen? But if we're going to have a church, it says, well, I only preach on money when it comes up. I never even preach on the budget every year. If it comes up and I'm in the passage, that's where we go. I, it's my responsibility to teach us that it's, it's our responsibility to tithe and to give to the church and, and grow it up. And if everyone did that, we'd have so much money we wouldn't know what to do. But I also enjoyed this morning telling you that we had a big offering last week. And listen, we give certain percentages. Can I remind, I want to tell you this. We had, we took the percentage of offering this week and gave to our missions offerings that we do. We, we try to do it. $6,800. So we were able to support and help Dallas and his family in Burkina Faso, the Brewskis. We sent uh, funds, good chunks this time, to Cincinnati, our church start, the Bridge City Church, Christian Learning Center, the Pregnancy Resource Center, some uh, uh, the fish, other things that we support, we were able to send almost seven thousand dollars to those ministries. You know why we did that? Because of you. You did that, and so we're doing our part. But if you were to just start a church, you, you, I mean, y'all want to start a church this morning? You're starting a church, okay? All right, Floyd, you're starting a church. Charlie, you're starting a church. Miss Lynn, you ready? She said, we've done this already. <laughs> she said, I don't worry. Listen to this. Let me just remind you of a few things. Y'all all right? Where are you going to meet? Wow. Who's going to lead? How long will that person do it for free before you have to pay him? Y'all all right? Will you incorporate so you can get tax-exempt status? Who's going to pay the fee for rent? And who's going to pay the pastor? He can't, take, he can't work for chickens. You know, I've actually had people tell me, you should be working for chickens and eggs. Walton EMC will not take chickens. <laughs> Who pays the state for the nonprofit status? Who pays the Sunday school literature? Who's going to pay for the heat and air? Who does that? For fellowships, who buys the food? Where did the paper products come from yesterday? Who buys the baptistry? I know who bought that piano. I know who bought that piano. You talking about, you, you talking about a happy day when we put that piano in that warehouse? To God be the glory. Y- y'all, I'm telling you all awesome. It, in early days, God blessed us. It was so much. We'd sit around a staff meeting and join and say, well, we need, we, well, we need this. I said, I know. Let's just pray about it. 
I called Jesus Christ as my witness. Next day, I opened a door in the office over and I said, hey, who are you? I'm so-and-so. Uh, would y'all need a copier? <laughs> Come on in. <laughs> we were just praying about you. How about the fellowships, the, the, the baptistry, all these things, plates, offering plates. Did you know we had to, we had to have offering plates? Uh, the Lord's Supper stuff, renter's insurance, workman's comp, liability, insurance over this building because people perceive churches as having big money. They're always suing churches. Counselor's insurance. Did you know I have to have counseling insurance in case someone doesn't like the advice that I give them and they sue the church? Uh, toilet paper, paper towels. We have to pe play people to get snakes out of the bathroom. I mean, <laughs> trash. Trash cans, copier paper, postage, furniture for the staff. Do you know that Bobby Brooks, the furniture that's in my office, Bobby Brooks bought that furniture for me. He said, no, I don't want this belong to the church. This is yours. And if you retire or something happens, you take it with you. Took me to office backs and bought $3,000 worth of furniture. That's where my, my desk and things came from in there. Uh, the staff has to have furniture. The chairs you're sitting in at the time, Lane, I think they were 40 bucks a piece, right? So 40 bucks times 200 chairs, and we had to buy another 100, was 7,500. Who's going to paint the walls? <laughs> so, so it's like, I mean, so where does all this money come from? And the Bible says, in Matthew 6, 19, do not store up treasures for yourself on earth where moth and rust destroys and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves in heaven. That, that's, that's what he says. Do you know where all the money came from to get this here? You. Because 18 years ago, there's a group of folks that gathered around Brother Jerry and his heartbeat and his vision. And they said, Brother Jerry, I want to stand with you and invest in the ministry of Woodlake Baptist Church. And the Lord put this verse on my heart when we started the church. And the, it's Psalm 4.3. Having been led by God to follow his plan and purpose for our lives, we, the servants of Christ Jesus, our Lord, come together in sacred unity on the 30th day of October 2005 to establish Woodlake Baptist Church of Walton County, Georgia, believing that the Lord has set us apart as the godly for himself, as stated in Psalm 4.3. The undersigned are this day uniting publicly to constitute a new work for God that will leave a legacy of encouragement and love through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why you hear me say all the time, I talk about leaving a legacy, and Woodlake's a place of encouragement and love. But better than that... Uh, Sanford, can you hold this up for me? I want to read some names off of here for you. Okay, if you'll come up here with me, big guy. All right, that's the, I won't keep you too long. Now, the first folks on here were Jerry Gray, and then we had other folks that have, that have kind of come and, come and gone. Uh, but I want, I want, there's a few names I want to catch right here. Uh, Miss Joan Wheelis. You remember Miss Joan Wheelis and... Uh, Lynn Long and Huey Long, they're still with me, still with me. Y'all all right? Gina and Carrie Rowe. Uh, let's see. Becky Bridges and Lane Bridges. Becky's in heaven this morning, waiting on Lane. Don't go nowhere too quick. And by the way, how old are you, buddy? 89? 88. Ann Brooks is going to be 90 this week. To God be the glory. Ann and Bobby are on here. Uh, uh, Beth, uh, Beth Sexton, John Paul, uh, Carol Sexton, Rick Offord, my friend that's in heaven. Uh, the Offords on here, Evie and Hunter, 
Uh, let's see, some of the others I want to catch right here real quickly. Um, that Betty and Miss Susan Camp and Betty Driggers, Owen and Nancy on here, Linda Holloway, John Holloway, uh, the Boozers, y'all remember the Boozers, uh, the Moons uh, uh, that were here, Patricia and Lynn, Lynn, Joe and Patricia still with us as well. And it just, just goes down here uh, how precious these folks are to be that are on this list. Um, Vicki and Gary is on here still. Vicki and Gary still with us. Um, our charter membership. We had Ronald and Donald, uh, two twins that were special needs. And I'll never forget when June and Shorty came to me and said, Brother Jerry, can they sign the, the charter? I said, you better believe it, baby. And to have those two special needs twin boys come up and, and sign that. And then uh, there's so many other Cavenders were on here and the Brookses and, and as we went through. And then when I get over here to the end, I wanted to just say this. Uh, Junior and Brenda Blake. Junior and Brenda have been here since the beginning. And he just went to glory. And our folks who were charter members with us, a lot of our folks are going to be with the Lord. But I want to tell you something. Every name that's on here, all of these folks, you're the seal of my ministry. And I am grateful for you. I don't know what I would do without y'all. And I want to say to those of you who are here, if, if you can't find a better group of people, and I feel like Paul the Apostle this morning, when I look out at you every Sunday, I'm thinking, where would I be? Somebody came the other day and they said, gosh, I haven't been in a while. There's so many new people. I said, yeah, but there's so many older people too that have been with us for so long. And God blessed us. And I hope, listen, when we started Woodlake, there were so many people who were in opposition to what we were doing. Not only did we start Woodlake, we did it with a lot of opposition, a lot of talk, a lot of misinformation. But here's what the Lord told me that day. You be godly, Jerry Gray. Don't fight back. Don't lash out. You're allowed to defend yourself. Keep pushing on. If you'll be godly, the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. You just be godly. And the Lord will take care of your business. Amen? Thank you, guys. Y'all can set that down. Now, let me pray for you. And uh, I love this. Paul says to them, I have rights, but I'm giving them up. You notice verse 12b, Paul says this. We've not made use of the rights. Instead, we endure everything so that we'll not hinder the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much, God.